Thank you for tuning into the Pictures of Lily podcast. I'm your host, Lily Moyeri. I've been a music journalist since 1992, and I interview a lot of music-related people. This podcast is about my experience behind the story, my experience doing the interviews, just to give you a snapshot of what it's like on the other side of the digital recorder. Pictures of Lily. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for tuning into the Pictures of Lily podcast. This is episode 33, an auspicious episode because of its connection with 33 and a third RPM vinyl records. And also the subject of this episode. Thank you again for listening. And to every new person that discovers us, welcome. You can find us on every platform by going to picturesoflily.com where you can subscribe or follow us and also connect to us on SoundCloud. YouTube, Pandora, and Amazon, although it's really best to listen to the podcast straight from the source at picturesoflily.com, as it is the best quality audio. In this episode, I'm going to talk about my experiences interviewing DJ, producer, label owner, and all-around cool guy, Errol Alkin. Here are a few snapshots of my experiences with Errol Alkin. The first time I interviewed him was in 2012 for a double compilation he had done for Bugged Out, which is an event promoter in the UK. This was for DJ Times Magazine. Errol was in Los Angeles to play Hard Summer, so I had the opportunity to interview him in person. I met him at the Standard Hotel in downtown LA for the interview. Besides being an inventive DJ, Errol is a producer, but not in the conventional sense of DJ slash producer. He produces non-electronic music bands, including some of my favorite albums from Late of the Pier, Mystery Jets, and Ride, the subject of our last episode. This is what Errol had to say about bands and their musical personality. When you love a band, you love their musical language, and each song is a message. Bands' outputs are a series of accents, vocabulary, scale, idealism. I always say to the bands I work with, try and make each song as different as possible. It will always sound like you. You have a unified voice by how you play, how you lock together. Some of the most groundbreaking artists of all time, you'll recognize them from song to song. You'll always know a Bowie song. Even before the singing starts, you know it's him. As humans, we pick up on the minor details, the milliseconds between notes, the silences as much as the sounds, all those things that inform an artist. I thought I was prepared for this interview, but I didn't realize until we were in the middle of it that Errol had produced the late of the Pure album, Fantasy Black Channel. I totally spun out and went off track telling him how much I loved that lone album, which by that point was four years old and not at all relevant to our interview. That same evening, I was going to go to Hard Summer to check out Errol's set, but there was a lot of issues. First, we went over to where they had the tickets and they didn't have my name, so that took a while, but they finally gave me some tickets. Then we stood in a long, dusty line before getting to the security... They took one look at me and told me my purse was too big. This was a crossbody purse. They told me to put it in my car, but I told them I had taken the metro there as the festival had suggested and there was no place to put my purse. The security did not care about this. I called and texted a few people about the dilemma, went over to the Chinatown metro stop to wait and see if anyone would get back to me. Then finally, I just went home and it was a big letdown. Five years later, I interviewed Errol again, this time on FaceTime for a compilation of remixes, or as he calls them, reworks. This is for artists like Tame Impala and Justice, released on his own fantasy sound label. Errol has this amazingly black and glossy, long hair that covers most of his face if he lets it go, which can be very distracting when you're interviewing him, but he tends to pull it back. 
I think his lovely hair distracts Errol as well. By this point, he had produced the excellent Ride comeback album, Weather Diaries. When I interviewed Ride, this is what Andy Bell told me about Errol as a producer. You're inviting another head into this intimate room where you're going to work on this music and it's kind of embarrassing. This is the nitty gritty of being in a band. It's not cool in any way. You're bringing your offering to the band and you're trying to make it work. And when you have someone in that room, in that place with you that shouldn't be there, it's so wrong. The producer role is really important to get right. I knew Errol would be coming at it from a different perspective and I thought it would be really good for us. Left to ourselves, we'd be more skittish and move from idea to idea. We probably wouldn't be able to do the ideas we thought of ourselves, or we'd have a great idea and get bored of it quickly. It wouldn't have been seen through in the same way. With Errol, what he's great at is loads of enthusiasm and energy, and then the actual patience to see the idea through. It's a great mixture of patience and excitement. This is what Errol told me about being a producer. I view it as a jigsaw puzzle that's broken into pieces and the picture on the puzzle pieces isn't fully formed yet. But if I know what that picture is going to look like, I know how to put the whole thing together. With Ride, I felt that if the songs were strong enough, then it will be fine. That's what I always liked about their old records was that no matter how noisy and dissonant they were, there was melody and at the heart of it was something really interesting song-wise as well. I interviewed Errol a third time in 2019. This time it was not about him as a DJ where we also talk about production work, but as a producer. It was for Mix Magazine and about his producing both Ride albums. In particular, This Is Not A Safe Place, the second one he did with the band. It didn't seem possible, but together Errol and Ride pushed the musical envelope even further with this album. This is what Errol said about it. You can't just make an album as an experiment. You've got to aim for it to be better than what's come before. It's really hard to do that when you love what came before. For me, it's about how we capture the essence of who and what Ride are and make the album sound as timeless as their previous albums have been. Andy from Ride had told me that Errol, who is of Turkish descent, didn't speak English for the first few years of his life. Errol clarified that for me. This is what he said. Being part of a tight Turkish community and living between my parents and my grandparents and not going to any nursery or anything like that, it wasn't until I was taken to nursery at the age of five that they realized this kid can't really speak English. Growing up, you can be made to feel like your culture is a negative. You try so much to fit in, you don't actually discover your own culture and appreciate it until you're older. And that's my snapshot of my experiences with Errol Alkan. You can find all three articles I wrote on Errol from DJ Times, from DJ Mag, and from Mix Magazine, linked at picturesoflily.com. In the next episode, I will be talking about my experiences with Michael Kiwanuka over the last decade. Michael is nominated for a Grammy this year for Best Rock Album. By the time of the next episode, we'll know whether he won or not. Tell me a tale that always was. Sing me a song that I'll always hear. 
From myself and my co-producer, director, editor, Lawrence Schroeder, thanks for listening. And if you have a chance to subscribe or follow the podcast on any of the podcast platforms, please do so. And please rate and review. You can connect to us on picturesoflily.com and from there you can choose your preferred podcast platform or SoundCloud or YouTube or Pandora or Amazon. You can also find the playlists for the podcast episodes on Spotify and YouTube. Once again, thanks for listening. Pictures of Lee.